My name is Matt, I'm a paramedic. I've been with American Medical Response for uh, almost five years. My name is Britt, I've uh, been a paramedic for five years. My name is George, I've been a paramedic for now two years. When we are actually working on calls, it's, uh, it's really fast paced, uh, it's, uh, it's intense, there's a lot going on around you. It can be kind of hectic, kind of chaotic, but it's, it's a lot of fun. A lot of independence, a lot of thinking on your feet, not having direct supervision and being responsible for some pretty, some pretty heavy stuff at times. We have calls that are pretty high intensity, maybe like um, multiple casualties or children or like big, big heavy things. Um, they have a, it's called a critical incident stress debriefing where they get all the agencies in that were involved with that scene. You just sit down at a table and people just kind of say how they like feel. Everyone deals with pain or grief differently and, and as employees we do the same thing. Um, you know, it's, it's generally easier because we're not emotionally involved with any of the patients that we're dealing with and you kind of have to be able to detach yourself emotionally and just fall back on, on this training that we have gotten, you know, just, just doing our jobs, physically assessing people and trying to help in any way that we can. Um, and then we deal with, with our own emotional baggage afterwards with the debriefings and, the, and, and that kind of stuff. It's kind of sick, but we make a lot. We make a lot of jokes. All of us do. We have. A, if you don't have a kind of a twisted, sick sense of humor before you start doing this, you end up having it. I think that's pretty uh, um, common through all of like emergency services. Is you tend to laugh at a lot of things that probably most people wouldn't laugh at. I think that's probably the biggest coping mechanism. During it, uh, when it's actually happening, you kind of, you don't really, at least for me personally, you don't notice it as much as until afterwards when you have quiet time, you kind of sit there and go, and, and when it kind of sinks in, and because when, you, when you're in the moment, at least for me, it's, uh, you kind of just do what you're supposed to do, and you don't see, or it doesn't register a lot of the things that are happening around you. I mean, it registers on, a, like, a, I guess you'd say a technical level, you know, um, but as far as emotionally, you, that part kind of just gets shut off until you have time to kind of sit down and, and really kind of absorb what, whatever it was that just happened. And that's usually, for me, that's when things start to correlate between you know, stuff that may have happened in the past, in my personal life and stuff. Um, I mean, there's always calls that you run on people and you kind of, it hits a, a different nerve because, you know, a it, it, person might look close to your mom or resemble your mom or have the same accent as your mom and you see, you know, the pain. So you think of your own family and stuff like that and how much pain that, you know, and you're grateful that they're okay and things like that. So, yeah, there's always times that something's triggered something inside of you. It's just kind of how you deal with it afterwards is the big thing. You know, I've been fortunate not to have anybody what I'm really, really close to pass away. And, you know, my first experience with uh, with death on a call, it, you know, it was a younger person. I believe he was in his 50s or something like that. And it's, it's just kind of interesting because, you know, you always hear about someone older passing away. You really don't think of it as the younger. So, you know, it made you appreciate life a little bit more and cherish your friends and your family and... You know, you want to keep them close and tell them I love you and, you know, I care about you a little bit more. I was seven when I lost my first grandparent. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a really uh, very surreal experience going, going, watching the family grieve and going to the funeral. And, and I really didn't comprehend the, the long-term ramifications of having lost my first grandfather. Um, and having lost other grandparents since there's a very emotional component to you know losing a family member and and that you can't really um, put into words when you're comparing it to to death on the job um, you it's always a very detached um, focus that you have when we're going into another person's home and we're dealing with death in another person's home. You, 
you don't allow yourself to to buy into the family's emotional because we can't um, we have a job to do while we're there and, and that has to be our primary focus everybody wants to see kind of what's going on what are they doing you know and human nature you know human nature we're all curious we morbid, all want to morbid curiosity exactly we all want to find out what's going on and if it's happening to someone else it's a lot easier for us to detach I mean that's kind of like Brett was saying with our job people just detach themselves and go look at them and go oh ill look at that oh but because it's not related to you it's not your family who cares it's just an it's just another person out there Generally, uh, fire captains or police officers will try and separate uh, family from the victim, especially if it's an emotionally charged scene. Sometimes it gets really emotional in there, and you have to ask for more people to come in to help the paramedics separate that. But, you know, as soon as someone passes away, we're the first ones really to kind of come up to you, and, you know, we try to tell the person, we will stay on scene as long as it takes to make sure that that person gets their assistance. Either if they need a priest or, you know, uh, it's just an ear or a family member, just anything, we're there and we'll stay on scene as long as it takes to make sure that that person feels supported at that time. You know, it's taught me that everyone does grieve differently. You know, uh, everyone goes through all the stages of grief, but, but they don't go through them the same and there's no right or wrong way and um, it's made it it's made it my experience has made it easier for me to speak about death and and you know it's it's made me um, come to grips with with death and that it, families deal with it every day uh, and most of us don't see that most most of us only have a handful of days in our lifetime where we'll have to deal with something like that and it takes that stigma away from death and you understand that it's just a natural part of life and you know everything has a start and everything has a finish. You never know when your time here is done. I mean there's, there's been it so many times where you see people that are one minute driving along having a wonderful you know Valentine's Day weekend and the next minute one of them is dead because they crashed the car. Just coming home to your family every night and you know giving your wife or your husband or you know your, your significant other a kiss or your kids you know or whoever it could be even your dog you know just appreciating every second you have because we've seen things that has happened to young kids we've seen things happen to old people where you know it doesn't matter if it's your time it's your time and so you just hope that you have one extra day and you know every day you're you're I at least I feel blessed and, you know, thankful that I have one more day and enjoy that and live it out to the fullest.